Well, what you're about to hear is a work in progress. The first version of this paper was intended for the Australian New Zealand Society of International Law. At that point, I was arguing that we should, in fact, initiate arbitration under Annex 7 of UNCLOS. No? Then, um, after that conference, I proposed an abstract for the Asian Society um, biennial meeting, and it was to examine the, um, the um, jurisdiction of the um, conflict settlement procedure under the UNCLOS, anticipating that the Philippines will already uh, file the um, arbitral claim, as in fact the Philippines did. No? So for the Asian Society, I presented a paper on jurisdictional issues, no? because that really is the threshold issue as far as the arbitration claim is concerned. No? There's a court, there's a tribunal have the competence to rule and decide on the matter. And then in the conference, something unusual happened. The sitting judge of China to the International Court of Justice, Judge Suwe Han Kim, stood up after my 25-minute presentation and said that because all other Chinese scholars were denied visas by the Indian government, she felt compelled as being the only Chinese in the audience to articulate the Chinese view. Of course, the audience was dumbfounded because judges don't do that as a matter of course, especially if the matter could end up in their court. No? So there was a sitting judge of the International Court of Justice, passionately speaking for and on behalf of China, and for the first time, restating in a comprehensive manner the Chinese view on the Philippine arbitral claim. Prior to her presentation at the Asian Society, we've had to rely on the writings of scholars who, like me for that conference, um, extrapolated on what could have been the Chinese view because obviously they have opted not to participate. So for today's purposes, what I will do now is to modify my presentation. I will assume that Judge Sue's um, submissions were, are in fact the Chinese view on the matter. And I will now submit that there's been joinder of issues on the matter of jurisdiction as far as this arbitral claim is concerned. So, we all know that we have initiated the arbitral proceedings. We know that the prayer asks the tribunal to rule on three primary matters. Number one, a declaration that China's nine-dash line finds no validity under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Then we wanted a ruling that certain low tide elevations over which China has built permanent structures within the disputed Spratis group of islands are not islands because they're low tide elevations, are not subject to title, and are therefore, should be declared therefore as part of the Philippine continental shelf. And as far as Panata itself is concerned, we are asking that the waters around the 12 nautical miles generated by the islands as territorial sea should be adjudged to form part of the Philippine EEZ because Panatag is only 122 nautical miles from base points of the Philippines. No? We all know what the factual antecedents are for filing the claim. We had our first warship and in our excitement we deployed it to Panatag, allegedly to arrest um, Chinese fishermen who were caught in possession of um, protected species. We never got to arrest them because Chinese government vessels intervened and in fact, since that time, China has been in control of Panatak Shore. But shortly after that incident involving the Pilar, we've had, number one, a travel advisory, um, cancellation of group bookings to the Philippines, and there's been certain importations of pineapples and bananas from the Philippines held at customs in China. There was a momentary fishing um, ban imposed by both countries, but shortly after the ban, China permanently deployed government surveillance vessels which are armed, fully armed. No? And as of September 2012, they are in full control of Panata, which is why I think the Philippines compelled, was felt compelled that they, we had no further alternative. I'm borrowing from the words of Justice Carpio in his presentation. What happened in Scarborough was an invasion, and we had no alternative but to seek recourse under the rule of law, which was through arbitration under Annex 7 of the UNCLOS. 
We all know, of course, that China has not responded to the uh, Philippine notification. It has said that it will not participate, as in fact, it had refused to name its arbitrator. Now, we have bits and pieces of the Chinese position on the arbitration and on Panatag itself, including the Spratlys itself. One of the latest pronouncements was on February 2012, which were in China made clear that it was not claiming the entirety of the South China Sea. But nonetheless, in May 2009, in, by way of opposition to the joint filing of a um, foreign extended continental shelf on the part of Malaysia and Vietnam, China, of course, repeated the mantra that it has indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea and the adjacent waters and enjoys sovereign rights and jurisdiction over the relevant waters as well as seabed and subsoil thereof. Then it appended the nine dash lines. I've pondered many times on this assertion of China and finally realized that the Chinese view of the Nan Dash Lines is that it's not purely maritime territory, it's maritime territory generated by land territory. As in fact, Wang Yang Island, which actually begins from where Scarborough is, according to the Chinese view, extends all the way to Macles Field Bank, which is 202 kilometers miles away. And that is why the Chinese refer to both Maclas Field and um, Panatag as Wang Yang. No? And that at least gives us a clue that in so far as there is an island with a length of 202 nautical miles, to them it must have generated a further 200 nautical miles of exclusive economic zone. Now they have also criticized the Philippine claim on both Spratlys and Panatag on the basis that it is a basic principle in international law that land dominates the sea. And they have consistently said that UNCLOS allows coastal states to claim a 200 nautical mile EEZ, but coastal states have no right to harm the inherent territory and sovereignty of other countries, implying therefore that where there are maritime zones generated by land, then a country relying on a purely maritime claim cannot prevail, as against Title of One, Angkor and land, no? And they have said that any attempt to use UNCLOS to change the territorial sovereignty of a country is a violation of the principles of international law. And it has also said that the maritime jurisdiction of the Philippines should hence not infringe upon the territorial sovereignty of China over the Wang Yan Island. Now, we brought the arbitral claim under Article 286 of the Convention. Under this article, it says that any dispute concerning the interpretation or application of this convention where there is no settlement shall be submitted at the request of any party to the dispute to the court or tribunal having jurisdiction under this section. Now, under this section, countries could choose where they want to bring issues of interpretation or application. They could choose to bring it to the International Court of Justice or to the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. And where parties to what the dispute did not select either tribunals, then there is a default procedure, and that is ad hoc arbitration. And that is why we initiated, the Philippines initiated ad hoc arbitration under Annex 7 of the Convention. Now, what are the jurisdictional bases by which the Philippines, at least as far as my analysis is concerned, filed the arbitration? No? Well, to begin with, it must be because as a party to the UNCLOS, China had already agreed that all inter issues involving interpretation and application must be brought to the dispute settlement procedure of the UNCLOS. You see, UNCLOS is unique. Number one, it took a very long time to finally um, agree, well, to conclude. It took us almost 40 years to conclude the convention. And this is because we agreed, or the countries of the world said that in order for the convention to be binding on everyone, every single provision will be agreed upon on the basis of consensus, not just a majority vote. And in order to ensure that it is binding on all parties, or in all states, they said that parties to the convention cannot make reservations. You cannot provide for opt-outs. And that is why the only thing that countries could file when they ratified it were declarations. And both China and the Philippines filed declarations. Now, on the basis of submissions made by Judge Sue, apparently China does not agree 
on our interpretation that all parties to the own clause are bound by the discrete settlement procedure. I'm quoting her. Huh? China's declaration is an opt-out of the dispute settlement procedure of UNCLOS. Countries, furthermore, that ratified UNCLOS I are not deemed to have waived all their historical claims to land and maritime territory. So her position is, although literally the reservation made by China pertained to subject matter jurisdiction, she claimed it was an opt-out of the compulsory jurisdiction of the UNCLOS um, settlement procedure. And moreover, and this is rather important because the Philippines in fact enacted a baseline law no? to be fully compliant with UNCLOS, and I guess the, the, the rationale of the law is we cannot sustain our historical claim to vast amounts of territorial seas and internal waters which are contrary to UNCLOS. No? The more startling revelation was as far as China is concerned, when it ratified UNCLOS 1, and Judge Suwe said that 40 other countries filed similar declarations, not one of these countries agreed to surrender the historical claims um, by becoming parties to the UNCLOS. Now, why do we say that the issues that we submitted in the claim are issues of interpretation or application? Well, despite the fact that the factual antecedents that led to the filing clearly involve disputed claim to territory, the prayer of the claim is very specific. It only wants a declaration, number one, whether or not the nine dash lines comply with international law, UNCLOS in particular. Then it wants an interpretation on whether or not specific features are in fact low water marks, because if they are, they're not susceptible of um, being acquired by title and should pertain to the Philippines as part of its continental shelf, and of course, the waters around the territorial sea of Panatag as being territorial. Now, the Chinese view, according to Judge Hankin, is number one, this is clearly a dispute involving land territory. Not only have we opted completely out of the compulsory jurisdiction of the settlement procedure, but this is about land territory, and therefore, UNCLOS is wholly inapplicable. No? And she did mention that, in fact, as far as the disputed islands are concerned, Spratlys and Panata, our domestic law incorporated them under regime of islands. Then she said, well, she said this, no? that Wang Yang um, refers to, well, the water um, territory is generated by substantial uh, land territory, no? which time immemorial pertained to China. Now, she was emphatic about the nine dash lines. And I was startled. Because when China hosted the last biennial conference of the Asian society, and she was past president, there was also a panel on the law of the sea. And the question was asked. It was in a paper presented by Professor um, Robert um, of MUS. No? The question was, was asked of the Chinese scholars, what exactly is the nine dash lines? And the very senior scholars who were in attendance in that forum, well, didn't know what to say. Finally, the most senior stood up and said, we're not sure, but it cannot be a boundary line. So I was surprised that Judge Sue in that conference now was saying, well, the nine dash lines has been around since the end of World War II. No country has ever questioned it until oil resources were discovered in the area. And this is most intriguing no? because she gives us a clue on how China perceives the nine dash lines. No? She said that the general rule in international law is anything that is not prohibited is allowed. And she says that when you have historical claims to both land and water, there is no positive rule of international law that prohibits making or having these historical claims. So I guess they're arguing the language of Lotus what is not prohibited is allowed, and they're arguing for Suwan to the first declaration of Taiwanese authorities that the Nine Dash Lines represents historic land and maritime territory. Now, of course, in my study, I had to look at the jurisprudence of both the ITLOS and the ad hoc arbitrations under UNCLOS, no? on how the different tribunals interpreted in, um, the phrase or the words issues of interpretation or application. We don't have much case law on this. In fact, we have 20 cases brought by 
um, both parties to the ITLOS. The 20 does not include the claim of Netherlands against Russia and the claim of the Philippines against China. No? And we have eight ad hoc arbitration filed under or with the PCA. Our arbitration is also under the aegis of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And in all these cases, in all these 28 cases, the tribunals did not have any difficulty in ruling that there was prima facie jurisdiction because they applied um, the ordinary meaning of a dispute in relation to interpretation or application of the UNCLOS. Under general international law, um, a dispute is defined as a disagreement on fact or law. And in these 28 cases where the court found prima facie um, jurisdiction, they had no problems in saying that there is a disagreement on the interpretation of a provision of a specific of, of a specific, uh, specific provision of UNCLOS. No? And so, by and large, there was always prima facie determination. Of course, there are some cases such as the uh, the tuna case, no? where in the judgment of the of the tribunal, eventually they said they had no jurisdiction. But in that case, there were provisional measures um, issued by the court, and the court previously found prima facie that it had jurisdiction. Now, should it be a problem, despite the language of the Philippine claim, that a, an arbitration may potentially involve other issues other than interpretation or application of the UNCLOS? Well, this has been decided upon, the latest of which is in Guyana versus Suriname where the tribunal, the ITLOS, was asked to declare whether or not there was resort to an unlawful use of force on the part of one of the disputing countries. And of course, the other country, Suriname, said, well, you can't rule on that, because that's, an issue, that's not an issue of interpretation or application of the UNCLOS itself. But the tribunal said, well, look at the language of the dispute settlement procedure. We're not limited per se, to issues of interpretation and application, we can also rule on the basis of general principles of international law. And that is why the court pronounced a judgment saying that there was, in fact, unlawful use of force in this case. Now, the more problematic area of jurisdiction, I believe, is the subject matter jurisdiction submitted by China. And it specified three subject matter to be beyond the um, dispute settlement procedure, no? disputes involving delimitation, disputes concerning military activities, including military activities by governing vessels and aircraft engaged in non-commercial service, and disputes concerning law enforcement activities in regard to the exercise of sovereign rights or jurisdiction. It's problematic because the factual antecedents might involve at least number two and three. And of course, if you buy the Chinese line, the Chinese line is, well, these are areas, maritime areas um, generated by land. Therefore, it is actually an issue of delimitation. And you will fall under the first reservation made by um, China. No? Now, moreover, the UNCLOS, before um, resorting to the dispute settlement procedure, requires that there be first negotiations and agreement at the first instance. And because of this, well, I think that China, she did not actually address these issues, no? but I extrapolated that China must be arguing that since this is maritime territory generated by land, it's an issue of delimitation, and therefore outside of the jurisdiction of the settlement procedure. And of course, what happened was, fishermen were driven away by government vessels no, sent by China. No, those would clearly fall under two and three. But the problem is, we did not ask the tribunal to rule in these matters. We could have asked for provisional measures, precisely because the case law is, where there is a dispute as to who should fish, then provisional measures may issue to prevent fishing meanwhile. But you see, I think the, the lawyers were cunning enough not to ask for provisional measures knowing that it might fall under two or three of the Chinese reservations. So literally as it stands, even if the actual disputes may involve some of these reservations, the prayer itself 
none of the prayers themselves call for um, any of the reservations specified by China. Now, the Chinese view, and this was articulated by her, was this is a delimitation issue, and therefore, we must negotiate and come to an agreement. Okay? And then meanwhile, we should come up with provisional arrangements of a practical nature. And under case law, some of the provisional arrangements of a practical nature involve, guess what? Joint exploration and exploitation. Which I think is why China is insisting on joint exploration and exploitation. Well, the funny thing was, I knew that she might actually raise an issue because prior to the conference itself, it's the habit of the Asian society that the Executive Council will meet before. No? And in the Executive Council, the first thing she said was, I need to talk to you. And we talked. And her point was, we should really explore joint exploration and exploitation. To which I said, Madam, I'm an activist in the Philippines. You're talking to the wrong person. I sue the Philippine government. I am not the agent of of the Philippine government. But I told her, yes, I am stepping down from the executive board um, and my successor would be the um, Solicitor General of the Republic. So perhaps she can talk to the Solicitor General about it. But the point now is, while there is an obligation to negotiate, there is no obligation under international law to keep on negotiating till kingdom come. In fact, this was the ruling in Barbados versus Trinidad and Tobago where, the, again, the ITO said that where there is an obligation to negotiate, it is well established as a matter of general international law that the obligation does not require the parties to continue with negotiations which in advance show every sign of being unproductive. And I think this is well provided also in the article claim filed by the Philippines. It has, in fact, alleged that since 1987 or thereabouts that the Philippines has been attempting to negotiate with China to no avail. But in any case, that seems to be the general context of the offer of joint use. It's of a provisional nature, of a practical character, which I think was rightfully rejected by the Philippine government simply because it is referred to as the sovereign right um, pertaining to the exclusive economic zone because only one state should engage in exploration and exploitation of the resources found in these waters and in the continental shelf. Now, what are my conclusions? Well, I think we have joined their issues on the basis of the interventions made by Judge Suez. A very important issue is whether or not it is true that countries that deposited declarations under the UNCLOS opted out of the compulsory dispute settlement procedure of the UNCLOS. My view, well, I've articulated that. The manner by which UNCLOS was arrived at, specific provision that states cannot make reservations, and the fact that despite this, China deposited a declaration relative to a specific, again, provision of the UNCLOS where countries are allowed to um, exclude certain subject matter jurisdiction from the dispute settlement procedure proves that, je uh, that Judge Suez's position must be wrong. I think the correct view is you can opt out of specific subject matter, but you could not opt out as a party to the UNCLOS. No? Second, and this to me is very, very important, is what is the effect of prior historical claims to maritime territory. She was emphatic that since there are 40 countries that made declarations, all these 40 countries must not be deemed to have waived all their earlier historical claims to territory by reason of their being parties to the UNCLOS. Again, this is important because the Philippines state practice when we pass the archipelagic baselines law is that yes, we have surrendered historical claims to large amounts of territorial waters and internal waters. But then again, I'm biased because we question that law. Now, <clears throat> but of course the more important issue, and this is a matter really of um, still jurisdiction, no? is whether or not the Chinese view that the nine dash lines is by reason of land territory will divest the arbitral body of its jurisdiction. You know, the funny thing is, 
in the end, Judge Su is said, why is China not participating in the arbitration? And this is a direct quote. It is because no country can fail to see the design of the Philippines. It mixed up jurisdiction with the merits. But look at their position on the nine dash lines. Isn't that equally mixing up jurisdiction <coughs> with the merits? The UNCLOS has no jurisdiction because these are maritime territories generated by land territories. Our prayer is, please declare that the nine dash lines finds no basis under the UNCLOS. And yet, her position was, it was the Philippine claim that mixed up um, jurisdiction with that of the merits. Now, what is my prediction? Well, I'm an academic, I can do, I can engage in these predictions. Well, to begin with, it's very clear that the tribunal is proceeding. It will be judged, so judge of its own competence. I think China um, is at a disadvantage because it opted not to participate. Although, quite frankly, I'm not sure if Judge Sue spoke out as a private or as a public person. Some will say that given her stature, she's really the, the revered figure in international law in China. Prior to her appointment to the ICJ, she was the first ambassador to ASEAN. She was an ambassador to the Netherlands. She was head of the um, treaties office of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, head of the legal office of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, was groomed to be head of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and forms part of the Executive Council of the People's Party. No? So some are saying, at least the Indians in the audience said, no, she did not speak as a private person. She spoke um, as a Chinese um, um, authority on international law. I guess they want to make it clear why they're not participating in the proceeding. But in any case, by not participating, they have waived the right to officially argue, although I have to say that despite the fact that it will be ex parte, no, the tribunal will have to entertain and rule on the issues which China has raised. And the reason, of course, is unless they do that, their arbitral award, whatever it may be in the future, may not be accepted by all parties concerned. So arbitrators generally, because there's no police to enforce it, will write their decisions in a manner to please all parties to the dispute. How will the court rule? Well, I don't want to actually come up with a very clear prediction. All that I can say is number one, as Rosalind Higgins said, International law sometimes is not just about the application of legal rules. It is actually the intersection between power and authority. If the, 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 the tribunal decides to exercise its jurisdiction, well, it must be because in their assessment, the international community will support that decision. If, however, they feel that countries like Russia and China will not honor its decision, will ignore it, then they might think that it would be probably for the greater good not to exercise jurisdiction. Thank you and good afternoon.